I am reading two passages of scripture from the Psalms this morning. I'm reading the first verse of Psalm 127, followed by the first five verses from Psalm 27. Unless the Lord who builds the house, unless it is the Lord who builds the house, the builder's work is pointless. And from Psalm 27, the Lord is my life and my salvation. Should I fear anyone? The Lord is a fortress protecting my life. Should I be afraid of anything? When evildoers come at me, trying to eat me up, it's they, my foes and my enemies, who will stumble and fall. If an army camps against me, my heart will not be afraid. If war comes up against me, I will continue to trust in God. I have asked one thing from the Lord. It is all I seek to live in the Lord's house all the days of my life, seeing the Lord's beauty and constantly adoring his holy temple. Because he will shelter me in his own wealth during times of trouble. He will hide me in a secret place in his own tent. He will set me up high, safe upon rock. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Holy and gracious God, we ask you to quiet our hearts and open our minds and ears that we may hear what word you have for us this day. Bless our time of thinking, speaking, and listen. In the name of Christ. Amen. Several years ago, my wife and I attended a professional conference in St. Louis, Missouri. During our days there, we spent ta time walking through the renovated Union Station that has been transformed from a transportation hub to a fascinating shopping center that's adjacent to the Bush Stadium. We attended a concert of the world-class St. Louis Symphony Orchestra in the famed Orchestra Hall. We spent an afternoon walking around the Central West End neighborhood, which is the center of university life, as well as the location of the world-famous Barnes Memorial Hospital. And at the very center of that community, that historic community, is the Cathedral Basilica of St. Louis. The St. Louis Cathedral is one of the few Romanesque and Byzantine Gothic cathedrals ever built in the United States. The grandeur and the beauty of the cathedral and its surrounding gardens is actually beyond verbal description. As is the case in most cathedrals, workers, even to this day, continue to build and rebuild that magnificent cathedral. It is and has been a labor of love, and the work seems never to be finished. As we toured that cathedral, we learned that the groundbreaking was in 1907, after nearly a decade congregation began using the building in 1914, but the building was finally dedicated in 1928, after nearly 20 years of construction. In 1914 dollars, it cost over $3 million. Now let's set a context for that figure. Our main church building, the building that we are sitting 
was built between 1914 and 1916 at the cost of about $300,000. In 1912, a St. Louis artist was retained by the congregation to begin the fulfillment of a dream that they had. The congregation had a vision for the interior of the basilica to be done exclusively with mosaic art. We learned that there were nearly a dozen artists that were hired to design and implement the various sections of the cathedral, including artists from the Tiffany Studio in New York City. We learned that the main basilica employed three successive generations of artists. There was a grandfather, or the father, a son and a grandson who worked on this enormous project until it was finally completed in 1988, five days before the grandson's death. It was an unbelievable challenge. There was over 41 million pieces of glass that were used that mosaic with over 7,000 different colors. All the glass work was strategically placed piece by piece to artistically tell the story of Jesus and the apostles and the gospel writers, as well as the great stories from the Hebrew tradition. To describe the mosaic as gloriously beautiful is a complete understanding need to see it, to believe it. Now think of it. For 76 years, three generations of artists were committed to completing an astonishing work. The vision of the people of faith was met by a vision of skillful Extraordinarily, that vision passed from one generation to the next. In the case of this one family, the grandfather taught his artistic skills to his son, who then was able to teach the same set of skills to his son. The docent spoke admirably of the faith demonstrated by all three generations of the artists. She spoke with incredible respect and honor about how each of the artists gave themselves completely, working diligently to fulfill the dream. It was more than a job. They understood that their artistic vision would instruct and inspire people of faith for generations to come. Friends, Sacred spaces have always been important to the people of God. It seems that there is a longing, a longing deep within us to have a space that is conducive for worship and prayer. We seem to have a need to create sacred places and then go to those places where we can meet God grow in our faith, and enjoy the company of other people in the journey of faith. It's always, always been that way. In the story of our original ancestors, God created the Garden of Eden as a place for Adam and Eve to both live and prosper. But it was also, also a place where God could meet God's creation and enjoy fellowship and during the era of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they regularly built altars as a way to both mark and remember their various meetings with God. The altar became a sacred place of worship where sacrifices were offered when the people of faith were seeking the counsel of God. They also offered expressions of gratitude for God's gracious generosity. 
As Moses led the children of Israel through the wilderness, the tabernacle served as a mobile sanctuary that was able to move with the people. The tabernacle housed the Ark of the Covenant. It was important to the people of faith. They needed to have a tangible way to symbolize God's presence and action among them. The mobile tabernacle, of course, gave way to the building of the temple in Jerusalem. King David, you might recall, created a vision. He had a vision for a glorious temple to honor God. But he entrusted that vision to his son Solomon, who finished the temple. Based on the biblical description of the temple, it was elaborate and ornate, as well as enormous. It was the house of God, dedicated for the worship of God's people. As the people of faith continued to develop, the synagogue was birthed. And as a community center for worship and education, the people also believed that every community needed to have a rabbi who would teach the Holy Scriptures and celebrate the rituals of faith and lead the people in remembering and invoking the presence of God in their lives. After the resurrection of Jesus, there was, of course, the birth of the Christian Church. A new dimension of faith was born with its focus on faith in Christ, along with an evangelical thrust to proclaim a message of faith, hope, and love. The New Testament, you might recall, was an underground church because believers could actually be imprisoned or executed for their faith. Christians needed to be careful for drawing attention to themselves or their community of faith because it was dangerous dangerous to be a Christian. Friends, over the centuries, the people of faith have gathered for worship in house churches or simple meeting houses or open air, brush harbor, whole building, barns. We worshiped in our private homes, in nature, in chapels, in sanctuaries, or in elaborate cathedrals. Place has always been important to the people of God. But as the psalmist said so beautifully, unless the Lord builds the house, the work of the builder is wasted. Over the years, I have read or heard that opening verse from Psalm 127 more times than I can count. In nearly every context, of either speaking it or hearing it, it has been at a dedicatory or an anniversary event of a congregation. I used that phrase frequently when I spoke or prayed at anniversaries or dedications of buildings in the district when I was a superintendent. I remember using that particular phrase as the basis of comments that I made when a congregation decided to close. Not because I believed that God had abandoned that congregation or failed them or they failed God, but because I believed that God was doing something new. Something new was emerging among them, even though it was painful for them to hear. I learned that sometimes we must love God and love God's church more than we love our memories, more than we love our desires or even our personal agendas. Probably one of my favorite psalms is Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I be? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom will I be afraid? Many of the texts from Book 1 of the Psalter, which is Psalm 1 through 41, are attributed to David. Now that doesn't mean that David penned each of those songs, but 
he probably was at least the editor. He collected the songs that he felt were appropriate for the people of faith to recite or sing. When we look at Psalm 27 and we overlay it against the biography of David, it's almost as though Psalm 27 is an outline of David's life. The key to interpreting Psalm 27 is found in verses 4 and 5. I have asked one thing of the Lord. It is all I see live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, seeing the Lord's beauty and constantly adoring God's holy temple. Because God will shelter me in his own dwelling place during times of trouble. God will hide me in the secret place. God will set me up high on a rock of sand. Now, if you happen to be a student of the Psalms, you would agree with me that one of the major themes in Psalms is dwelling in the house of the Lord. Listen to a few phrases. I rejoiced with those who said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Better is one day in the courts of the Lord than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I love the house where you live, O oh God, the place where your glory dwells. Marvelous texts, aren't they? Marvelous texts that continue to call the community of faith to dwell well in the house of the Lord. But what's happened? What's happened to us? What's happened to that sense of yearning and longing to dwell in the house of the Lord? However you want to interpret that phrase. What's happened to developing that sense of reverence and respect and all, longing, living, and resting in the presence of God. What's happened to our fundamental faith value to abide in the Lord's house? Maybe. Maybe we think our current spiritual needs are different from our ancestors of the faith. Maybe they are. Maybe we think we don't need to belong to an institutionalized community of faith in order to be spiritual. Certainly the church, as we know it, has its issues. Certainly there are times when our actions do not line up with our stated values or our beliefs. And yet, my friends, as imperfect as the community of faith is, we are called by God to participate in it. As a seminary of te teacher of mine used to say, the church is a lot like Noah's Ark. At the end of the story, it's still the best thing. God, friends, still calls us. God gives us the opportunity to, to completely give ourselves to a journey of faith. God is still, after all these centuries, inviting you and me to be part of the same journey. But that journey, I believe, involves being part of a community of faith and continuing to wrestle with the question, what does it mean? What does it really mean for us to dwell in the house of the Lord. For me, and perhaps as a personal testimony, I think 
I can't go to today, who said, I have asked one Well, in the house of the Lord forever. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you for being with us this morning in worship. We trust that God has spoken to you in whatever way you have needed through either the prayers or something that was said, the hymns that we sung. Dwelling in God's house. What does that mean to you? There are lots of different ways that we can interpret that. But the issue is, are you resting? What does it mean? I believe that all of us need to wrestle with the question, what does it mean to dwell in God's house? So go with God's grace. 